Saunas is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Saunas and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. As today, we are wrapping up the 2020 NFL Draft and talking about the betting implications of what went down with Dr. Eric Eager of Pro Football Focus. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, the draft is in the books. It was... A lot of fun to watch and have just something to talk about on Twitter. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, it, it, it was fun to get some live sports. I, you know, I, I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would. Why? I thought a lot, I thought a lot of things were kind of weird with the presentation and just the remote and, like, you know, what what stage is the prospect at when he, like, finds out? I thought I yeah. thought a lot of it was really kind of kind of strange, you know? Yeah. Like, it was it was obviously different for the obvious reasons, but it just... Yeah, the broadcast wasn't as enjoyable as I, as I wanted it to be. I think my standards were so low because of <laughs> what we've been deprived of the past months, a yeah. uh, couple months. I was like, I will take whatever. You could have, you could just have a camera on Roger Goodell as he gets into weird poses for four hours, and I won't complain. I'm, I'm in. You know, let's but, do this. But that was part of the problem. Like when yeah. he made fun of himself for people booing him in a silent room in his basement, it was just weird. <laughs> Yeah. It so was, like I didn't get to see that part because we were we were doing our live stream on the FanDuel YouTube page. So all I saw right. was him like turning around and like talking to people and he would take <laughs> forever to spit out the pick and I was just like angry because I was like, just say the pick so we can analyze it. Come on. Right. You're just drawing yeah. this out to torture me. And I so I didn't get that part. Well, and then the what however many minutes, like how many fifteen minutes before they even put the Bengals on the clock and then the Bengals yeah. take the entire time. Yeah. And, you know, so it's like 20 some minutes until we get the first pick, which we all knew it was going to be anyway. Right. Yeah, that was uh, it was interesting. And uh, that one, it, it's always the first pick because you always know what's going to happen and just decide to draw it out. But um, any big takeaways from the draft for you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, Green Bay situation. Uh, I've been ripping on Green Bay for for a while. Uh, we expected them to do a lot of things, uh, like get a wide receiver to help out Aaron Rodgers, and of course, they you know go get a quarterback in the first round, uh, get a running back in the second round. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was nice for them to actually do that, so we could have something to talk about. So I appreciate it. <laughs> it was uh, not actually. nice if you have Aaron Rodgers and Aaron Jones in your dynasty teams. And, like, you're hoping for Aaron Rodgers to get some help. You're hoping for Aaron Jones to continue to be a kind of do-it-all type guy. And both those dreams were shot. And so I was not exactly as excited, despite the fact that it is fun to occasionally dunk on teams. I was just kind of mad the whole time that they decided to sabotage me. I think this is a personal attack by the Packers against me. Yes, definitely you and maybe a little bit Aaron Rodgers. Yes, exactly. Uh, what else stood out to you, you know, um, as far as the draft goes? It was it was pretty chalky, but anything else stand out to you? Yeah, no, it was pretty chalky. You know, I mean, I think um, seeing Tristan Wirfs uh, not be the top lineman off the board, but actually don't be the fourth me. lineman off the board don't, don't, and then don't go don't to Tampa me. Bay. Let's not, <laughs> let's not talk about Tristan <laughs> Wirfs. <laughs> Um, and yeah, well, I actually get into them a little bit later in, yeah. in covering the future. Uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. Otherwise, yeah, pretty, pretty chalky. And, uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, it, it was live sports and, and that was nice. I think the one thing that was disappointing for me was day two when the Bengals decided to take a wide receiver instead of offensive line. And this is something we talked about when we were discussing Sam Darnold and how to best bolster his performance was get offensive linemen, put him in bad situations left off less often. The Bengals have a pretty bad hole uh, at several spots along their offensive line. Left tackle would be better this year with Jonah Williams back. But I was kind of hoping they'd get a right tackle to help him out there in the draft. And I had talked about the Bengals over previously on this show under the assumption, which is dangerous on my part, that they would do something to improve the offensive line during the draft, and they didn't do that. Right. So I, I guess I, I was just kind of... Like, I, I loved having the draft, but it also, like, kind of, like, made me fidgety and angry for a couple of reasons, too. <laughs> well, I mean, they're certainly going to they're certainly gonna be that. We all have vested interest in these teams uh, with various bets. So, yeah, I mean, some things are going to make you angry. 
Uh, what are your what's your outlook for Joe Burrow in year one? Uh, I feel like I'm the lowest on Joe Burrow out of anyone I've talked to. People think that he's going to come in and, and lead a team. Um, all quarterback, rookie quarterback struggle, even the first picks. So we got to we got to put that out there. And I still think there's just something to, you know, the fact that we saw one good season from Joe Burrow. Couldn't win the job at Ohio State, transferred down to LSU. And, you know, he was amazing last year, but I just need to see more. And it gets infinitely harder when you get – not infinitely harder, but it gets significantly harder when you get into the NFL uh, week week by week. And um, I I just see him struggling. Yeah, I think – so there are two different ways – two different things that that weigh on my mind here. The first one is a – like you said, the profile is not pristine because he's older and older, less experienced first round picks at quarterbacks at quarterback never pan out. Like if you look at guys who fit in those buckets since 2000, only one of them has gone on to have a top 10 season in net expected points, which is number fires expected points metric. Right. There's only been one top 10 season and it's not just one player. There's only been one total season. That was Carson Wentz the year he almost won MVP. Outside of that, like Mitchell right. Trubisky, Mark Sanchez, you run through the list of these guys who are yeah. 22 or 23 and don't have a lot of experience coming out, a lot of them butts. Now, and there's also the offensive line, thing, which I talked about, where he's going to be put in bad situations often. The reason right. I am still okay with Burrow is that he was so freaking good it, <laughs> when things broke down last year that it's right. hard for me to say he can't excel despite a bad offensive line. But, you know, we talked to, we're having Dr. Eric Eager on today. He has talked about how performance in under pressure is less sticky because there's smaller samples and stuff like that. So, like, even that's not a, a major thing. So I get where you're coming from. I also, it's hard because, like, I want to love him, but, like, there are those, like, tiny red flags that are always kind of, like, flashing in the back of your mind a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, as impressive as he was last year, I mean, there was always the play against Georgia where he, you know, got away from an NFL caliber linebacker and and made a great play. There were two of those Uh, actually against Georgia. And I had gifts of both and saved in my computer because they were awesome. Yeah, they were awesome. But, you know, that's like every play in the NFL. And I just uh, I just have my doubts about whether, you know, I mean, he's I I think no one's going to disagree with me that he's going to struggle. But I think. um. I don't know. I, I, I don't I, I expect him to, I, I expect him to really struggle. I mean, yeah. I, it'll be interesting to see who the backup there is, uh, whether they keep Dalton around and whether that affects things um, and how that season's going to play out. Um, I, clearly, it's going to be one of the, a great storyline to follow uh, for the season. I don't recall who it was, but there was someone on the Ringer NFL show uh, with Kevin Clark who was talking about how there was actually extra value in Andy Dalton this year because of COVID-19 and how he can be like a mentor uh, in helping Burrow assimilate to the NFL. So I thought that was super interesting. But asking a rookie mm-hmm. to go into a team with a bad offensive line and succeed in year one is tough. Uh, but we'll certainly see. We're going to talk more about the Bengals with Dr. Eric Heger. He is a data scientist at Pro Football Focus. You can find him on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric. We're going to talk with Eric about the actual value you can gain from the draft from a betting perspective which teams did the most which teams did the least and how that impacts their win totals for this year we're gonna have plenty more content coming up on covering the spread as well because sports are starting to come back very slowly usc is back next week nascar is back the week after that so make sure you are subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher you name it we are there make sure you are subscribed and if you like what you hear from us or dr eric eager make sure you uh rate and review the podcast as well now before we get to dr eric eager we got to do covering the past for the first time in at least two months uh go back through (laughs) some of our nfl draft bets and well they definitely could have gone better covering the past all right we did have a couple of draft bets here on covering the spread that we wanted to discuss and not all of them went so hot, and I think that they make more sense when you note when we note when they occurred. Uh, the first one we had was back in November. It was, I think, the week after Tua hurt his hip. I mentioned taking that eleven to one to go first overall, and that was before Joe Burrow went absolutely like unconscious against uh, the teams he played in the SEC championship game, in the semifinal, and in the finals. 
And it made sense that that one didn't hit. Uh, but I thought my the thought process was he was this hyper efficient young quarterback who did so against good competition. So I don't mind the process behind it, despite the fact that it did not work out. Other ones that occurred during draft season, Ed alluded to Tristan Wirfs. And Tristan Wirfs and I are not on speaking terms right now. Um, I had mentioned the under on Tristan Wirfs draft slot at eight and a half. Obviously, that did not hit. Um, I'd also had a piece up on number fire, how it was, uh, I was talking about the Jets' first overall pick. And I was like, okay, you know, I think there are two lines of thought here. You go with the guy most likely to be available, or you go with the guy that I think they would want the most. And the guy I thought they'd want the most was Tristan Wirfs, and he was 7-1. to one. So when we were on the draft stream, and I was like, okay, you know, the, the, the overhead on Tristan Wirfs' draft slot, but he's still here for the Jets at 11, and I could hit 7-1 to one there, and they went Mekhi Becton. <laughs> So, oh well, we had yeah. a good run. Uh, we yeah. did mention the Jets draft an offensive lineman here on covering the spread. That was plus 110. It hit not a big hit, obviously, uh, because it was just plus 110. But, hey, you know, we'll take it. Uh, the other one I had was no running backs draft from the first round at plus 150. I was feeling so good <laughs> about that for 31 picks. <laughs> the Dolphins passed. The Seahawks passed. It was great. And the Chiefs ripped my heart out. I think this was like... Betting nope. karma, like repayment, Ed, because they were so kind to me in the Super Bowl. They were like, ha, you've had your fun. Now we're going to break your heart. We talked about what would happen if it got late in the first round. And what happens if Kansas City had the last pick? And I think we actually said, oh, that's a lock. Like, how are they not going to pick up something, uh, a player to help their secondary, a cornerback? Yeah. And then, of course, they they draft a running back. Yeah. I that's knew that. I had a good feeling the Dolphins wouldn't. But, like, you look at the history of, of, of Andy Reid, and, like, he had never taken, with the Chiefs, a, a running back in the first two rounds. I don't think in his entire life he had taken one in the first round. Right. Um, and I knew that they were probably in play for running back. They also had only five picks. I thought they might trade down. There were right. a lot of reasons I was pretty good with this at plus 150. We almost got there. It didn't quite get there. Uh, so... This is this is just payback for me for them doing well for me in the Super Bowl. Uh, we had talked last week about the number three pick, about it going against Jeff Okuda, and I was on board with that one. We had um, you know a company like betting pool for the NFL draft, and I actually had Tua there uh, with the Dolphins right. training up. Didn't happen, yeah. Uh, yeah. but like it was an interesting pick for sure. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, I, I, I've heard some rumors that, you know, Detroit could have traded down and, and Miami definitely wanted two at that spot. And Detroit could have still gotten Okuda. Don't know if those are actually true, those rumors, but I think it would have made a lot of sense, uh, but didn't work out. And that's how it goes. There was another rumor that the uh, that the coaching staff in the front office were split, uh, where the coaching staff wanted Derek Brown. The front office said, no, we're going Jeffrey Okuda. So potentially some of the Derek Brown stuff may have been coming out of the coaching staff. Uh, and then the Jeffrey Okuda thing may have been via the front office. So we'll see how the, uh, how the, the sands shift there up yeah. in Detroit. Hopefully things go better for us post draft, but you know, you live in there and I select the process behind all the bets and I am not going to complain too much. Today's podcast is brought to you by FanDuel Racing. FanDuel is doing its part to continue to bring sports fans excitement by offering users the chance to bet on horse racing. Use your existing FanDuel DFS login credentials to gain access to tutorials to learn more about the sport, including understanding how the odds work, the various types of bets, and most importantly, how to win your bets. Watch all the races live across over 300 tracks and fill the void left in your sports fandom today. For more details, visit racing.fanduel.com or download the FanDuel app today. Eligibility restrictions apply. Let's bring in Dr. Eric Eager now, Pro Football Focus. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric. We're going to talk about the betting implications of the 2020 NFL draft, some win totals he likes this, this year, and uh, break down all his thoughts from this past weekend. Covering the present. Let's welcome Dr. Eric Eager into Covering the Spread. Eric, it has been a while since we last chatted. The draft is now wrapped up. You've hopefully had some time to rest. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, you know, all things considered, it, you know, so much has happened since we last talked. It was, you know, a lot of fun to see, uh, you know, Kansas City win the Super Bowl, and you know, we had about a, a fun month of XFL, and then uh, all this sort of crashed down. It was really fun to sort of get a live sporting event last weekend. 
Yeah, no kidding. It was fun to gather around on Twitter, make fun of the Packers again. I feel like it's the nation's <laughs> truest pastime. But we didn't, haven't spoken to you, like you said, since you were in Miami for the Super Bowl. What was that like to see the Chiefs, uh, you know, pull it all off? It was strange because I remember, you know, basically early in the fourth quarter, uh, I was in a group chat with some friends. And we, you know, when Mahomes threw that second interception, we all sort of resigned to the fact that the game was over. And then I you know, texted my wife that I was sad and, and then they, in classic Chiefs fashion, scored 21 points in like the last six minutes of the game. So it, it was a whirlwind. It was a lot of fun. Um, it's a crazy scene. Uh, and, and it was really cool to see somebody like Andy Reid uh, end up getting a, a Super Bowl ring. I think that was my favorite thing about it, too, is because we want intelligent decision makers to be rewarded so that the rest of the NFL will model their games after them. And then Andy Reid goes out and takes a running back in the first round, Eric. What's going on, man? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, the only people that were happy with that pick were people who had the over one-half running backs prop, uh, yeah, coupled that... with the under one-and-a-half running backs prop, which is I somehow lucked into those uh, or, you know, early in the process uh, sort of as an arbitrage, and then it ended up you know, getting the middle. But, yeah, as a Chiefs fan, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And then you see uh, today that they're starting cornerback who they just uh, gave a new contract to, I uh, got in a little trouble uh, down in Florida, as one does. So it, it's a it, it's a it, it's a little bit of a strange pick, you know. Obviously, we're going to give the Chiefs the benefit of the doubt because uh, you know they just won the Super Bowl and they're generally fairly good at, at, at making smart decisions. But that one, other than if you're a fantasy player, was a pretty big head scratcher. Yeah, uh, I think for there, it's definitely pretty exciting. So it's conflicting because it's like, uh, I'm excited to use Clyde edwards Lair in like everything next year. But, yeah. you know, uh, regardless, <laughs> we still love Andy for sure. Now, let's talk about the impact of the draft here, Eric, because we get excited about the draft. There are lots of new players. It's fun landing spots. In theory, every team should get better. But from a practical perspective, how should it actually alter our short-term outlook for each team? You know, what's the actual tangible impact of the draft? Yeah, I think for most teams, it's pretty negligible because, you know, for example, with Joe Burrow, we knew he was going to Cincinnati. Um, we sort of knew that that team, if you take all of their close losses and give them like half a win, they were kind of a five, six win team last year. And then depending upon how you look, sort of look at it, I think Burrow is probably a one win upgrade over the combination of Finley and Dalton last season. So, you know, for them, I think that that's baked in a little bit to their number, although I kind of like the over as we'll talk about in a little bit. And, but for other teams, the only thing that I think hampers, it, it can hurt a team, I think, when there's an unexpected possibility of playing a rookie quarterback early. But I don't think it can help teams, you know, fundamentally, because as you guys know, there are very few non-quarterbacks that alter the point spread, uh, it, you know, in an NFL, uh, you know, game. Uh, and as such, there are very few players who move, you know, the point, you know, the win total any more than like half a win uh, in a given offseason. So, um, you know, I think of a team like Tampa Bay, uh, you know, they, they're a team that I think, you know, short up a decent amount of holes. You know, I think under is probably still a smart bet for them, but there's far fewer things that I think can go wrong for Tampa Bay, uh, you know, sort of moving in, uh, you know, to next year. And then there are other teams like, for example, I think the L.A. Chargers, if they have to play a rookie quarterback early, I think that will really there, there could be a situation where that over is no longer a good play. Excellent. Well, you kind of answer our next question in terms of if there's any teams that made sizable gains in your expectations. Obviously, everything you said makes sense in terms of, you know, what we know from non quarterbacks uh, affecting the point spread. Are there any other teams that um, that you want to mention that really stand out on uh, draft day? Yeah, draft you know, days? I think. Yep. And I, I think there's there's, a, you know, this time of year when you like a team's over, you have to be a, you have to sort of chip away at reservations you have. And for me, two teams in the NFC East that I think are far more fundamentally good than, uh, you know, the records indicated last year are the Dallas Cowboys, who by all indications, if you look at yards per play, if you look at points for and against, you look at, uh, you know, the players on the team, they were much more than an eight-win team a season ago. They opened at nine. I think it's nine and a half now. I have fewer reservations about them having taken Trayvon Diggs to replace Byron Jones uh, and then adding C.D. Lamb to a strong receiving core. Uh, I have fewer reservations about going over for them or betting them uh, as the favorite of the NFC East. I, but interestingly, I think the same thing about the Philadelphia Eagles because 
You know, they were a team that struggled at the wide receiver position. They were playing AAF players there towards the end of the year. Uh, they just got a whole lot of good athletes and good players in the draft. So those two teams in an NFC where I don't think it's particularly top heavy, there's a lot of good, not great teams. I, I think those two teams are firmly in, in that position. So for me, those two teams were the ones that changed it the most for me. And I think the Eagles are interesting because we saw them be aggressive in trying to address what seemed like a lack of athleticism on that side of the ball, on the offensive side of the ball last year. Getting Marquise good when you can question that. But Jalen Rager, I mean, he was a super high usage guy at TCU. What's your outlook for the Eagles now that they have made those changes and then also potentially increase their floor should Carson Wentz get hurt by adding a guy like Jalen Hurts to the fold too? I mean, I think that's exactly it, right? Hertz is such a Hertz is like a no downside player at this point, other than the draft capital that they took him with. But you know, they you know, Rager was a guy. I think the stat was is he had the among the top receivers in the draft. He had the highest rate of uncatchable passes thrown his way at TCU. Uh, you know, as far as athleticism score, he was off the charts from a jumping and running perspective, and that was even with a poor performance relative to what we expected uh, at the combine. Uh, you know, they they. They even added, you know, you know, deeper options there. Davion Taylor as a linebacker, you know, Malcolm Jenkins leaves, goes to the Saints. Davion Taylor is an athlete who was extremely, you know, Isaiah Simmons and then everybody else for me at the linebacker position. I think Taylor was underrated relative to the rest of the guys like Queen and Murray that were taken a little bit higher. So, you know, I really like, you know, where they're at. And, you know, with the coronavirus being a thing, with conditioning, my, you know, being an issue, I mean, they've already seen Carson Wentz has taken this team to the playoffs three consecutive years and has played less than 10 playoff snaps. So you, you, they are trying to mitigate, you know, Josh McCown gave a gutty effort in January, but they're trying to mitigate having that circumstance happen to them again. Uh, where they have to go with their back of quarterback and the team against them is beatable, and they're just not good enough at the position to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Let's look at the flip side of things here. We talked about the teams that did well. Did any teams actively damage their short-term outlook based on what they did in the draft? No, that might be hard, but like relative to expectation, did any teams take a step back? You know, a, a relative to expectation, I think you could make a case that teams like Baltimore and teams like Kansas City, when you're when you're trying to hang 11 and a half win totals on these teams, I think the under is just more plausible, especially so for Kansas City when you look at what could go wrong. Uh, you know, that season they were so lucky that Bashad Breeland, uh, Trevarius Ward, uh, you know, those players were healthy the whole year. That if you get any sort of perturbation to that back end, I'm not saying they're not going to win the AFC West and, and be a Super Bowl contender, but getting 12 wins is extremely hard in the NFL. And I think with them only having six draft picks and using the top one on a running back, I think you add a little negative variance possibility to them. I think the same thing is true about Baltimore as well, because when you look at the you know where they struggled in the playoffs against Tennessee, it was really when they needed to get a throw by Jackson. They just didn't have reliable targets. You know, Marquise Brown is a great down the field player, uh, but none of their players were a you know Anquan Bolden type player. You know, to stop you know stop a yard ahead of the first down and take an accurate pass and get a first down. And they didn't address that position until later in the draft with guys like James Prochet. So, uh, you know, those two. And obviously, there's downside there. I think the clear one though is Green Bay. Uh, when you look at you know last season, they were 13 and three. And in many respects, they were the 49ers away from being 14-2, and two, the one seed and in the NFC uh, representative for the Super Bowl. And that's why they're trying to emulate the Niners. But if you look at the team-level fundamentals, they were really more like a 9- or 10-win team. And they're being hung a 9.5 right now. I think Detroit improved. Uh, Minnesota's an iffy one. But like, it's, it's going to be hard for me to go over that total for Green Bay uh, you know, coming 2020. Yeah, I want to yeah. circle back to the Packers here in a second. Let's talk about the Chiefs because they're really interesting because not only is their win total 11.5, but you're getting plus money on the under. Yeah. It's at plus 105. Do you recall seeing a number, you know, this large in the in the recent history? Because it seems like it seems like just monstrous. Well, we talk about Andy Reid. Andy Reid has gone over the Vegas total every single season he's been Kansas City's head coach. <laughs> um, and, and so I think a lot of people are just saying, look, I'm just going to bet it and forget it with Kansas City. I'm going to come up with my money no matter what. I mean, last season, you know, they had they had to start Matt Moore for a game. Uh, you know, Mahomes was banged up for a bunch of others. Hill missed time. Watkins missed time. And they still won 12 games. And, and and I think when you look at, you know, a lot of people say, well, they've only lost three games to the AFC West since 2000, since week two of 2015. Uh, you know, 
that division isn't getting a whole lot better when you look at the Raiders, but maybe the Chargers and Broncos are a different story. So I, it's just a trend. I mean, people, it's like the Patriots, right? For, for years, you know, people, the Sharps bet on the dogs against the Patriots and got hammered. And, and when you look at win totals in a specific market, A, you know, when Alex Smith was the quarterback, the market always underestimated the Chiefs. And now when the Mahomes has been the quarterback for two straight seasons, they, they've cleared the total easily. So they're, they're just they're just making they're just daring people to bet the under. And, and I frankly, even though I'm a Chiefs fan, I don't think it's a bad play. Yeah, that's super interesting. Let's head uh, circle back to the Packers because they kind of dropped the bomb on us late in that first round, trading up to uh, not draft a wide receiver to help out Aaron Rodgers, but uh, to take the quarterback, Jordan Love, who's definitely considered a project. What do you make of that? You know, I, I think the I think the love pick, interestingly, even though they traded up for him and he, I, you know, I don't think of him as a great prospect. That was their best pick of the whole draft, <laughs> and so <laughs> that that tells you everything you need to know. Like AJ Dillon, if you look at his combine measurables, awesome. You know, 250 pounds, over six feet tall, four four seven, I think four four nine, maybe huge vertical leap. Like he's a great athlete and he is a good performer, but in the second round, you know. Well, while you already have Jamal Williams and Aaron Jones there, it is, a, in my opinion, a disaster of a pick. And even though I like Josiah DeGuara as a player, he's more of a fifth, sixth, seventh round tight end. There's, there's no reason in a draft full of bad tight ends that you would reach for him in the third round. I mean, Kyle Juszczyk isn't worth a third round pick, and he's Kyle Juszczyk, right? If you're trying to project a guy into that spot, like it's nowhere near... Uh, you know that uh, that valuable. So, and then the out of their three or other four picks, you know, in this in day three, like three of them weren't even ranked by our big board. So, it, it was just a rough time. And now, part of me thinks to myself, okay, well, Rogers is going to be motivated. Um, you know, he's still, I think, you know, uh, first ballot Hall of Fame quarterback. There's a lot of things like, and, and the NFC North could be very weak. Minnesota had a great draft, but you know, the the COVID nineteen is probably going to keep them from having the development early that people think they will. Detroit's Detroit, and Chicago had, you know, almost as bad of a draft as Green Bay. So I, I still have a hard time being like, okay, an under's a lock here. But it, to me, it's the only side. Yeah, and looking at this one, you were talking about checking off concerns if you want to bet the over. Like, Green Bay kind of did the opposite? Because I think if you were to have concerns about them, you'd have concerns about, okay, is Ricky Wagner at right tackle? Is it Billy Turner? You know, what do they do there to replace Brian Bulaga? And can they get pass catchers to prop up Rodgers as his play declines? Do you think that the decline for Aaron Rodgers justifies the pick? I know you said it was the best one of the draft, but what's your overall evaluation of that in a vacuum without considering the, what they did the rest of the way? Well, I don't think Jordan Love is a first-round prospect. I, honestly, our projections really like hurts over him. Uh, even somebody like Anthony Gordon is a lot better. Uh, you know, Jake Fromm, those guys performed better than he did a season ago, and they played in tougher conferences. So for me, when I think of quarterbacks, you know, there's four or five, six of them where it doesn't matter, right? Every Anything can happen to them. Russell Wilson, you know, you can basically do anything, and, and I think he'll have success. Mahomes is probably there as well. Um, but for the middle class of quarterbacks in the NFL, all you're dealing with are uncertainties. I and mean, Kirk Cousins has had five or six offensive coordinators the last five or six years. Um, you know, Derek Carr is the same way. And, and so when people go and make excuses for Jordan Love, like, well, his supporting cast sucked, uh, his coaching sucked, like that's the life of, of a middle-class quarterback in the NFL. And if you can't overcome that, I mean, you know, that's the, one of the positives with Burrow is he changed offenses in one year and turned into the best offense we've seen in college football in, in quite some time. And so I, I just don't like him as a pick. Um, and so – I don't think he overtakes Rodgers anytime soon. Now, the cool thing, when you look at the, you know, for example, the difference between the Cowboys and the Packers, McCarthy and Rodgers' best seasons are when they had Jennings, Driver, and then they supplemented it with Jordy Nelson in the second round, uh, and then they went James Jones, uh, you know, and then they went Randall Cobb when he would have been their fourth receiver. They had a bounty of wide receivers, and what we've seen in Green Bay has, over the last three, four years is that has gone away, you know, piece by piece. And now he doesn't have anybody to throw to other than Devontae Adams, who was once their third receiver and now their best receiver. Dallas, of course, McCarthy learning from that, putting three good wide receivers on the same team. Packers haven't. And I think that will ultimately be the downfall of that offense, is that as much as they want to go big and as much as they want to run play action and scheme players open, 
you, you face third downs in the NFL when other teams know you're going to throw. And if you can't be diverse and you can't be multiple at the receiver position, it's going to be hard even for the best quarterbacks to have success. Yeah, for sure. So the Dolphins have made a ton of changes this offseason, both free agency and the draft. Uh, their win total is currently at six with, uh, you know, minus 120 on the over. What do you make of this Dolphins team heading into the next season? Yeah, I mean, this is one where you play the the division, right? So, um, you know, the Jets seem destined. The Jets are going to get a seven-win win total as long as Adam Gase is the coach, right? That's <laughs> basically him. And and you look, you, you watch last season, you look up, you're like, oh, my God, the Jets won seven games. You know, like, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, you know, I think New England is going to struggle. I think their draft is very much for 2021, uh, you know, and preparing that team for a good quarterback uh, eventually. And when you look at Buffalo, I think they have Chicago, Jacksonville, all the teams that popped up for a year and struggled under uh, poor quarterback play. I think they have them written all over them. So who's going to be the beneficiary? I think Miami. Uh, it depends upon how to, how much Tua plays, how much Fitzpatrick plays. Um, but you look at them, they have Devontae Parker at wide receiver. Um, you know, now they have Matt Burita, who's a pretty solid running back. They've done a little bit to shore up the offensive line. And the defense looks very Patriots-like uh, in, in many ways. Uh, you know, so I, I think over is the only play. Minus 120 is a little bit of a price to pay. Um, and, and usually you want to be on unders in this market. But this is kind of a fun one to root for. Yeah, the Dolphins were fun. They emphasized players who improved the passing offense and improved the passing defense pretty fun approach for them for sure let's talk about the Patriots who you alluded to there right now it looks like it's going to be Jared Stidham starting week one Cam Newton could still go there maybe Eddie Dalton but the cap issues are legitimate uh with yeah. the Patriots right now let's say Stidham does start week one what would be your outlook for the Patriots uh their win total is nine right now with minus 120 on the over <laughs> I mean it, to me I don't think you can hang a nine I mean you can't hang a nine in this league with guys like Bortles in 2018 right. or, or Trubisky in 2019 or, you know, even Josh. I mean, Josh Allen is even, even getting that kind of respect, although if you factor in the juice, it's pretty close. So, I you know, I can't imagine doing anything under uh, other than under is the play here for New England. I mean, with a historically good quarterback and, you know, a pretty good offensive line, they struggled to move the football in the second half of last season because guys like Mohamed Sanu can get, get it done. Uh, guys like Nikhil Harry couldn't get it done, and it's still unclear. They did draft two tight ends, but it's unclear, you know, if any of those guys are going to work out. The running back position, aside from James White, is sketchy as well. So, I just don't think they can move the football. And you look at that division. The Jets' defense last season was underrated, but pretty good. Uh, Bills' defense, we all know that they're a, a solid squad. And as you just said, the, the Miami Dolphins have been, uh, you know, in position, um, you know, to to make their passing game defense better. Uh, you know, the last two seasons after being one of the worst in football. Uh, so it's going to be hard for them to move the football. And as good as I think their defense might be, I just can't see just a defense only team having a winning record, let alone 10 wins. What was your evaluation of Jared Sidham coming out? Uh, he was an interesting guy because he, he had transferred mid-career and yeah. his numbers at Auburn really bad, but it's hard to, you know, suss out what is him versus what is the offense. What was PFS evaluation of Sidham last year? Yeah, he was he was certainly a late round pick, um, you know, worse, you know, sort of, I would say, like a little bit below somebody like Anthony Gordon, um, you know, six and a half yards per pass attempt, you know, that, you know, 58 percent. So not a good quarterback, you know, for the modern day NFL, which might be exactly what they want uh, if they're if they're going to try to get a quarterback like Justin Fields or, or Trevor Lawrence uh, come 2021. It's not a rosy outlook. And and if they want to win this year, they probably have to go with a different option in the QB position. Interesting. Uh, Eric, do you see any other win totals at FanDuel Sportsbook that uh, stand out to you? Yeah, I do. And, and you know, to, to you guys' point about the Chiefs, I like unders that pay out more than the bet. So, you know, Buffalo, for example, at 8.5 at plus 138 or 135 currently, you know, I like that one just because, again, when you're looking at win totals in the NFL, it, it's skew left. You know, because they're, for one, you add up the totals and they're all more than 256. And then when you and, and the number of bad things that can happen to a football team, football teams other than quarterback are extremely anti-fragile. So, you, you know, Buffalo loses a couple of those great players in their secondary to injury. Uh, they lose some offensive line play or the offensive line gets worse at a position. All those hurt you more than the fortification of those things benefit you. And then when you look at quarterback, you know, Josh Allen simply 
is not good enough, I think, to lead a consistently winning football team. Last season, he led the NFL in percentage of dropbacks that were negatively graded by us. So to me, that under, even though you know I thought it would open a little higher, maybe nine and a half at eight and a half plus money, I think it's worth. Uh, you know, I, I think it's worth it. The other team, which I talked about earlier, here, I like the Bengals over five and a half. It, it, at minus 110, it's the it's the best division in football, not named the NFC South. But, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with the teams above them. Cleveland, we saw how could, you know how bad they can be when things go poorly. Pittsburgh, obviously, like great defense a season ago. Does that regress? Uh, and is that is Big Ben coming back enough to deal with that reversion to the mean? And then Baltimore, I think, you know, there's only one way that they can go, unfortunately, which is I think it takes a step back. Um, you know, five and a half. It's really hard for a projection model to spit out a number lower than six uh, when you simulate a season a few, you know, a few hundred times. Yeah, we had talked so, about the Bengals over as well. I think that that one's interesting because it's not just getting Joe Burrow. Because like like you said, like Burrow's upgrade over the Andy Dalton, Ryan Finley thing is like not that much, but you add in Jonah Williams, you add in the free agency things they did on the defensive uh, side of the ball, get A.J. Green back healthy. That's pretty legit, especially when you're getting, you know, you're not paying a whole lot to get to six wins, essentially. Well, and they're, and they're a, you know, they went from being very fragile defensively to having a little bit of anti-fragility when you look at, you know, Trey Waynes, uh, Mackenzie Alexander, William Jackson the third is already a pretty good cornerback, and then they drafted three linebackers in the draft, and, you know, in the front, you know, the front floor, uh, you know, Geno Atkins and Carlos Dunlap are a pretty good pair of defensive linemen. So they could go from being a very terrible defense to at least an okay defense. And as you said, A.J. Green, I think, is one of the most underrated players of his generation. He comes back, Tyler Boyd, you know, and then they got Auden Tate and, and, and John Ross to, to fit in there. If the offensive line can protect Burrow even a little bit, I think that the team will be, you know, not great, but like six six wins is all you're asking for here. Yeah, absolutely. Six wins so, is Eric, not a whole lot to or- ask. Yeah, Eric, before we let you go, I mean, I, I, I believe you've made the, the smart choice of, you know, unders on high win totals and overs on low win totals, uh, that regression to the mean that we know is just uh, part of the NFL. What, what would it take you to kind of go against that? Uh, what, what would you have to see? Well, so here's one, and I'll give it. So it's not exactly the lowest win total in the world, but I think it's worth an under play, and that's the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, so they're at seven and a half. You got to pay a little bit. You got to pay minus 115 there. But when you look at the Raiders this season ago, all of their seven wins were by uh, one score or less. So if you do some sort of like rule of, you know, they're kind of a three, four win team if you actually look at that, uh, you know, ish, right? And so everybody, every person who just looks at the win totals from a season ago is going to look at the Raiders and say, oh, they won seven games. Uh, I just need them to improve a little bit. Drew Locke might suck. Chargers are starting a rookie quarterback. The Chiefs are going to regress. Let's go over this one. And I think when you look at changing uh, cities, uh, uncertainty surrounding the quarterback position, anytime you know you bring in a veteran to challenge the starter, it says a lot about the starter. And then uh, you know just simply like you know what they've done with their draft picks or what they haven't done with their draft picks over the last you know two years. To me, that's one where it's an example of I, I'm hardly ever going to go under a four and a half. But under a seven and a half is also tricky. But this one I, I particularly like. And yeah, I think it's that's also interesting too, because like the big flaw with the Raiders is their defense. The only defensive player they picked in the first three rounds is Damon Arnett, who didn't necessarily have like the highest grade. So yeah. I think that one makes a lot of sense too. Yeah, he yeah, was a twenty-three-year-old player at Ohio State and was just average, right? When he, yeah. when he loses those advantages in the pros, uh, you never know. Yeah, we got to remember the the Raiders were, I think, a win total of six last year. So uh, moving up a win and a half uh, performance probably doesn't uh, dictate that they deserve that. Absolutely. Well, that's Dr. Eric Eager. Eric, I want to thank you once again for swinging on by and talking about the NFL draft with us. Hopefully you can uh, find some things to occupy the time until hopefully we get NFL starting on time. We appreciate it and uh, talk to you again soon. Covering the future. One big thank you once again to Dr. Eric Eager for swinging by and breaking all that down. Find him on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric to get his thoughts on the NFL, the NFL draft, and so much more over at Pro Football Focus. Ned, I think that you asked Eric a really interesting question that I also wanted to spin back to you and get your thoughts on this. You asked him what it would take to get you to bet against the mean, you know, betting down, betting towards eight. What do you need to see personally in order to bet a team either under a low total or above a high total yeah i mean i think there needs to be something like 
um, something extraordinary, right? Like, I mean, usually if you have a strong quarterback, um, you know, maybe uh, you want to go over, like maybe Seattle nine wins last year was something that I kind of hemmed and hawed about. But um, obviously I had Russell Wilson. He had a great year. Maybe a situation like that uh, can work. Uh, can make you go over um, something really bad. You know, a team's going to potentially tank for the first pick, uh, you know, which we kind of thought about Miami last year, which didn't really work out. Um, but I mean, I think it's a rare situation where I really feel good about, you know, going under a six wins or, or over a 10. Um, Cause I think when you look back on those seasons, uh, those teams probably had some fortunate, bounces or fortune in terms of injuries that help them get to that point so i think you just want to stay away from those i'm gonna go slightly deviated from that with my covering the future but i want to hear uh your covering the future first one thing you've been doing is looking at you know power rankings based on win totals and we talked with, with eric about how like things don't change all or things shouldn't change all that much based on what the draft does but as we know public sentiment changes around the draft, which can lead to changes in betting lines. So uh, what have you seen change since the draft went down last week? Yeah, well, I mean, the biggest movers were three teams that that went up. Uh, The biggest was Tampa Bay. So they're still nine and a half wins, but the prices went from minus 105 to minus 135. Um, You know, part of that might have been getting Tristan Wirfs at at the 15th pick. Uh, He was one of he was the highest rated offensive tackle and offensive lineman in general. When you look at the data over at Grinding the Mocks, uh, where Benjamin Robinson combines a a lot of mock drafts, it was actually supposed to be about the fifth pick. Ended up being fifth pick overall. Ended up being the fourth uh, offensive lineman there. Um, So the public definitely liked Tampa Bay there. I'm a little hesitant about it. I, I think Worf's probably is going to be a good lineman in the long run. But when you talk so much about athleticism coming out, I think uh, that that might hurt him. You know, p- trying to play as a rookie against you know guys who you know def- edge rushers that will be able to use their athleticism against him. Um, so, anyways, uh, to give you an idea, that change in price, uh, their rating moved about three quarters of a point. Okay, to, to, so and this is taking from win totals at FanDuel Sportsbook and then backing out a rating for each team. And then the rating is just an expected margin of victory on a neutral side against an average NFL team. So the next biggest mover is actually Minnesota. So they're at eight and a half wins. Uh, their price went from minus 30 to minus 150. Markets seem to like picking up Justin Jefferson, the wide receiver from LSU as a replacement for Stefan Diggs. Uh, and then also they they drafted three cornerbacks in the next couple of rounds. Uh, cornerback is uh, probably the position with the least supply in the NFL. So it's always good to take uh, extra chances there. Um, so, you know, and they took a couple of Big Ten uh, prospects like uh, Kenny Willekes, the defensive end out of Michigan State, and, and Nate Stanley as well. So they were the second biggest mover. And then the third biggest mover was actually Detroit. So still at six and a half wins, but went from minus 135 to minus 150. Uh, I guess the market's like uh, that they got Jeffrey Okuda. So again, the cornerback uh, top rated guy in the class also uh, spent a lot of picks on the offensive and defensive line later in the draft. So, um, and then, you know, we've talked a lot about green Bay, you know, the markets didn't move too much. Uh, it was uh minus one five on the over for nine wins before it's plus 100 now. So, um, not a ton of reaction to not helping Aaron Rodgers out with a wide receiver. And I think that's interesting, too, because we talk about, I mean, I think that I'm partially in like a a bubble on the people I follow on Twitter and what they talk about. And they talk about the Packers and their bad draft, but they also talk a lot about the Denver Broncos and their good draft, because I think that what they did was, you know, one thing Eric talked about is how there aren't a lot of quarterbacks who are independent of their surrounding. And sure. what you want to do when you have a quarterback who is in that 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 blob in the middle is improve their surroundings. And Denver, we don't know where Drew Locke is on that spectrum. He could be right. someone who is irreparable, doesn't matter how good a situation is, or he could be in that blob. But what they did was they kind of ensured he would be good if he were in that blob, where he could be good with a good situation, by adding Jerry Judy and K.J. Hamler. So I guess I kind of expected Denver to be a team that might shift from an odds perspective, but it sounds like they didn't. Uh, they're at seven and a yeah. half and minus one ten on the over right now. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that didn't move. Yeah. So, 
We'll see. I mean, it's only been a couple of days, uh, maybe a week from now, uh, that will have changed. Yeah, the Vikings one is interesting, too, because, like, they basically took the the mindset of, we're going to get these picks wrong because we have less information, and they value analytics testing, like, more than, or athletic testing more than any other team. So they basically said, we're going to throw as much at the wall as we can and see what sticks. Because at one point, I think they had 17 picks for this draft, okay. which is just absurd. Yeah. Uh, they got, yeah. like, four picks from the Saints for a pick in the third round, and... Like, that's what you should do. I don't know yep. if it'd be enough to get me to change my thoughts on the win total, but, like, from a an actual, like, NFL perspective, like, that was a good strategy. I just don't think it would necessarily get me to bet the over on them. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, it is usually a good idea to trade down to give yourself more shots at the draft. Baltimore's been a team that has done that over the course of years, and they've built up a lot of talent on that team. Um, so yeah, to see Minnesota do that is, is definitely the right move and, uh-huh. and to use those picks to address positions Important. like cornerback where the supply exactly. is very low is, is definitely a good idea. And they needed someone to help replace Stefan Diggs, which is tough to do. You can't really replace Stefan Diggs, but right. Justin Jefferson at least helps bandage the loss of Stefan Diggs as much as you can. So improve the passing game, improve the pass defense, and things will generally go pretty well for you. For my cover in the future, I want to talk about the Cleveland Browns because they're a team that burned a lot of people last year from a betting perspective. Uh, They got a ton of buzz. Their odds got shorter and shorter, and they got shorter than they should have. But I think they've had a good offseason again and maybe a a bit of a lower-key offseason, and the buzz has been a bit more muted here. And right now, the win total for the Browns at FanDuel Sportsbook is 8.5. So I am saying to go over. However, you get plus 115 on the over, which makes it a little bit of a different discussion, hopefully not as egregious, uh, to go over on a win total over 8. But I do like that quite a bit because the offseason gains the Browns have had have been pretty big because they addressed both tackle positions, which should allow Baker Mayfield extra time in the pocket, improve the passing game, and that's a big thing. It also helps him be a bit more volatile in the positive sense because as the year went along last year, Baker Mayfield, his average depth of target went down because they had to get rid of the ball super quickly to avoid the pitfalls of that offensive line. And... Now, he should be able to actually do legitimate dropbacks and do that Kevin Stefanski offense where you do play action, bomb it deep, see what happens. They also added Austin Hooper, which should give him another weapon there. That is in addition to Odell Beckham and Jarvis Landry getting healthier, and that's good for the offense. But on defense, I think we're also overlooking the re-addition of Miles Garrett because their defense took a major hit when he got suspended. If you look at the Quant Edge, when Miles Garrett was on the field, Opposing teams averaged 7.4 yards per pass attempt, and when Miles Garrett was off, it was 8.4, so a full yard difference when Miles Garrett was out. Their sack rate also decreased to 5.1% from 8.5%, so a major deviation there, and Garrett will be back for this full season. They also added Grant Delpit in the second round. I think he's super interesting. He was banged up this year at LSU, and if he can return to his 2018 form, that could be like a home run level pick. So I would expect this number to rise a bit as the regular schedule offseason hype train for the Browns takes off, but I'd like to buy now on them. The division, you know, as Eric said, is pretty tough, but, you know, Joe Burrow is a rookie. Big Ben is an injury risk. So getting plus 115 on over eight and a half is enough for me to buy in. Ed, uh, what are your thoughts in general on the Browns heading into 2020? Yeah, I mean, I need to see Baker Mayfield have a little bit better decision making in the pocket. Uh, clearly having a little bit, you know, help on the offensive line uh, is going to help. Um, you know, are they just going to run the ball all the time? Given that Stefanski's, uh, <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. So so those are some questions that I have uh, heading into last season. We talked with uh, Teddy Covers about how they had the most talented uh, roster in the entire NFL. Mm-hmm. A lot of those pieces are still there. Um, I, I, I think heading into last season, we need, we needed to talk about the, the best roster in the NFL minus the quarterback position. Cause I yeah. think there were still some questions about Baker yeah. and, and, and those questions are, are still there, uh, yeah. heading into the season. So yeah, definitely a lot of talent. Um, you know, I think I definitely side on the side of over given, you know, the talent they have in the roster and a win total of eight and a half. Um, but um, still need to finish my analysis on that to, to really want to like that. 
Yeah, the two teams that we talked about, Teddy, is having the most talent were the Browns and the Eagles. And, like, both right. teams, like, had this wild, wild season. Uh, but I think yep. that both are in position to rebound. And Eric was talking about how much he liked the Eagles. I'd agree. I think that they're very interesting uh, just because they have a very smart front office, and I'm inclined to trust smart front offices. And I, I do value, like, the thought of a floor because – if you're looking at paths to an under for Eagles, one of them is Carson Wentz getting hurt, and I think it's less definitive sure. that they hit the under now with Jalen Hurts. Uh, you actually used to be an Eagles right. fan. So what, what were your thoughts on yeah. that pick in the second round? Yeah, well, a lot of thoughts. I mean, I have a lot of questions about Hurts as, as a thrower. As do uh, I. I, don't, I don't know if he can do it on the NFL level. We talked a lot on this show about how uh, Lincoln Riley just ran him more towards the end of the season when the defenses got better. And I think that's an indication that the coach knows that he's not going to be able to throw it against better secondaries. Uh, that just gets a lot harder in the NFL. So, um, but, you know, is he an asset? Sure. You know, could you have a goal line package with him using his running ability, his throwing ability? For sure. Uh, is he going to be a good backup quarterback? Probably. Um, it doesn't give me a ton of confidence. I want, I want right. to say, you know, like I, it, it doesn't, you know, I mean, you definitely want Wentz as a starter. Like, you know, I, I think my first thought when they made that pick was like, well, I mean, Wentz has nothing to worry about. Right. There, I mean, there's no way this guy's going to take his job. Right. But when you think about it in terms of, you know, having the backup, um, I, you know, it makes sense. Like, I, I think it was a good pick, but it, you know, I, I don't see Jalen Hurts being anything more than a backup quarterback in the NFL. I think that that's kind of where I'm at, too, because it's not because of the throwing, which I have my concerns about throwing, too, but it's more about, like, pocket presence. He had the longest time to throw in the entire nation last year, according to Pro Football right. Focus, um, and he had the highest sack rates of any quarterback in the top end of this class by a pretty wide margin. Joe Burrow was second, actually, which is interesting, given the offensive line he'll be playing with, uh, but... I think that that could be a concern, but if you get, like the way that we phrased it on the live stream was Jalen Hurts can be a backup plus. He can be a backup and potentially give you additional stuff outside of that, like if they do right. use him in a Taysom Hill type role. So I understood it. I actually, I, I liked it, even though I don't expect him to be a necessarily a starter or yeah. even like a good starter in the NFL. So interesting, interesting selection for sure, but it's one that... Got Philly Twitter all riled up. Uh, quarantine corner for this week, Ed. I think this is like week seven or something. Um, wow. It's been a long time. <laughs> uh, what is keeping you occupied in this uh, this weird age we're in right now? So I've been obsessed with Dummy. It's a show on Quibi. Do you know what Quibi is? We should I've heard of Quibi, there. but I've had no desire to check it out. So you have to sell me on this. Oh, interesting. So they're kind of evil. Uh, <laughs> they it's it's kind of like netflix but only on your phone yeah and everything's limited to 10 minutes okay and when they get you hooked on a show like i've been hooked on dummy like they only release these shows on weekdays so mm. not that we have enough things distracting us right from our work day but they need to just pile on um but with that said dummy <laughs> is about a girl who uh starts becoming friends with her boyfriend sex doll and <laughs> I love that reaction. That was kind of why I started watching it. And I, it's seriously one of the funniest things I have seen. And it's very meta. And um, so she's dating a guy who yeah. is older and a very successful writer. And she's trying to be a successful writer. And she starts hanging out with his sex doll. And it's <laughs> hilarious. So I would actually, I don't know. I'm kind of in my little bubble here. Yeah. Like I just started watching this and I just, I just, I can't do it when I can't laugh out loud. Like yeah. I, I started, stopped watching the shows. I still haven't got my wife to like watch it <laughs> to tell me whether, so I might be completely crazy. Sure. If you all go out there and like watch dummy and think it sucks, definitely let me know. Yeah. Cause I want to know if I'm crazy, but I just thought it was one of the most hilarious things I've seen in a while. That is a wild concept. And I want to be in the room when it was pitched. Like, what? Hey, I've got this idea. <laughs> Let me know what you say. Buy or sell. <laughs> like, and, what uh, a pitch. I mean, not that, not that I'm trying to, like, I haven't really found anything else on Quibi I like. Yeah. So okay. I'm not trying to pitch the service, but you okay. can sign up for it. And I think, I mean, I got 90 days free. I don't know what yeah. the deal is right now, but you can certainly watch it for free. Um, the last episode dropped this morning, so you can just 
binge it all, which I okay. think will take you like an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, let me seriously, if you watch it, let me know what you think. That's wild. Uh, the reason I was so hesitant is because I am admittedly quite lazy. And the idea of having to hold my phone for 10 minutes, like physically hold my phone at an angle and watch a video for 10 minutes right. is like daunting. I have trouble watching two minute videos on my phone because A, lack of attention. B, I can't check Twitter while I'm watching it. And C, <laughs> I'd rather just like, I'd rather just watch it on my laptop. So like, I, I, I think I am an abnormal media consumer because I watch so little stuff on my phone. And I think like, that's kind of like the whole pitch of Quibi is like, I might be the furthest thing from their like target market you could possibly get because I hate watching things on my phone. It's not like the little screen. I'm just superbly lazy and want to check Twitter while I'm watching it. Yeah. Well, and, and well, distracted, I would, <laughs> would say yeah. it would be that point, but <laughs> right. um, it's actually kind of frustrating because yeah. you can't stream it on your laptop. Yeah. Which is just dumb because sometimes I want right. to sit back and just relax and I'm in front of a bigger screen right. and you can't. Right. So that that's frustrating. But yeah. that hasn't stopped me from like, you know, waking up in the morning and <laughs> checking the latest episode of Dummy. All right. So let's check out uh, Dummy on Quibi to get all that because it sounds interesting. I don't know if I can necessarily get into Quibi just yet, but uh, you might have sold me with that. That is all that we have for today here on Covering the Spread. Big thank you once again to Dr. Eric Eager for swinging by and breaking down the NFL draft. Make sure you check out Eric on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric and go to PFF.com for all of his work there. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for working the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. If you have questions for Ed, make sure you find him at the Power Rank on Twitter, uh, thepowerrank.com as well. And the Football Analytics Show is Ed's podcast. I am at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. And you can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. We'll be back again next week to break down more sports as they start to trickle back into our consciousness. And we'll break those down with you and walk you through all the avenues you have to finally give in to that betting itch. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.